serve in ministry please come and see myself and uh, we'll find somewhere for you to serve uh, maybe you've got a passion for something or you've got a gift for something uh, please let us know and that will be a great blessing first corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 and we're going to read all the way down to verse uh, 29 and in just a couple of moments we are going to hold up our bibles how many people brought their bibles into church today all right, I don't see them. Come, let's hold up our Bibles in the air. How many people brought their Bibles with them to church? Come on. All right, you need to know this. This is very important. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 18 to 29. Four weeks ago, we started this series entitled, Each One, Reach One. Say that with me. Each One, Reach One. Say it one more time. Each One, Reach One. Okay, and the challenge was for every person to bring someone to church how many people know if everyone brings one person to church on one particular Sunday, the church will double in one day? If you do that just once, the church will double. How much more if you do it as a regular part of your lifestyle? And so that's the challenge. Proverbs 11 verse 30, the Bible says that he who wins souls is wise. And so salvation is a tremendous privilege, but with that privilege comes a tremendous responsibility. If you have been saved, one of the signs and the proofs that you are saved is that you want others to be saved. You are not saved to be selfish, but you are saved primarily to help others also become saved. There's a great responsibility. So four weeks ago, what did we say? We spoke about the heart of the New Testament church. We spoke about the heart of the church is to win souls. We spoke about the Lamb's Book of Life. Everyone say it with me. The Lamb's Book of Life. Say it one more time. There is a book in heaven for every genuine convert. If you are truly saved, if you are truly born again, the day you give your life to Christ, the day you are genuinely converted, your name gets written in a book in heaven. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. And when you die and stand before God, the idea is, the picture is, one of the archangels, maybe Michael, maybe Gabriel, they'll be standing at the gate and as you approach the gate, they're going to look for your name in the book. And if your name is found in the book, you will be allowed into heaven. If your name is not found in the book, you'll be cast into hell. My name's in that book. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, amen. And the reason I know that is because Philippians 4, 3 tells me so, uh, that um, uh, my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can look at Philippians 4, 3 later on in your own time. So that was uh, uh, week one, four weeks ago. Three weeks ago, we spoke about three heartbeats of the New Testament church. Uh, heartbeat number one was outreaching. Heartbeat number two was disciple making. How many people know you want, the Bible does not ask you to be a Christian? All right, nowhere in the Bible does it say go and make Christians. Instead, what the Bible teaches us is go and make disciples. Everyone say disciples. disciples. All right, so we're not trying to make you into a Christian. 
even though that's not a bad term, uh, but the more accurate term, the more biblical term, the term that Jesus used, Jesus never said go and make people Christians, no, Jesus said go and make disciples of all the nation, and we are trying to disciple people, when you get saved, Getting saved is just the first step. Now you have to be trained. Now you have to be taught. Now you have to be instructed. And the second heartbeat of the church is discipleship. The third heartbeat is evangelization. How many people know Coca-Cola has evangelized the world? Wherever you go on planet Earth, you'll find Coca-Cola. Uh, you'll go to Africa, Coca-Cola's there. Go to India, Coca-Cola's there. Go to Russia, Coca-Cola's there. Go to uh, uh, China, Coca-Cola's there. Go to Europe, Coca On every continent on planet Earth, Coca-Cola is there. How many people know the gospel needs to be everywhere in the world as well? You know, one man said that if God had given the Great Commission to Coca-Cola, the job would have been done already. If the world can be reached by Coca-Cola, by the way, how many people know Coca-Cola originally had cocaine in it? Yes. It was a drug. Where do you think the word Coke comes from? Alright, some of you are shocked by that. Look it up afterwards. Don't look it up during service. This is my time. You look it up afterwards. Do your own research. But Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. And it was seen as a medicinal drug even back then. It's called Coca-Cola for a reason. Coke, alright? And so, uh, amen. If Coke can uh, evangelize the world, so can the gospel. Two weeks ago, uh, we spoke about learning from Andrew. Andrew was always focused on bringing people to Jesus. Uh, Andrew overcame the prejudice of his time. He served about recognition. Then last week, we spoke about being fishers of men. Remember how we spoke about how everyone's fishing for something? Yeah. Some people are fishing for money. Some people are fishing for materialism. Some people are fishing for a mate or a spouse in life. Some people are fishing for meaning to life. And so we said that everyone's fishing for something. But Jesus says if you follow him, he will make us to become fishers of men. So we looked at three qualities or three truths about fishing. Number one, fishing takes time. Number two, fishing takes tenacity. And number three, fishing takes treasure. All right, and we spoke about the joy of fishermen. Uh, every fisherman, when they catch a fish, what do they do? They take a picture of them holding the fish. How many of you have seen that before? All right, they, they see that as proof. And then, you know, if they catch a fish, they take a picture of it. They send the picture out to their friends. Uh, when I go fishing on Tuesday and Saturday, if I can catch some fish for the kingdom of God, I'm going to take a picture of them. So I can also boast about what God has done and what Jesus is doing. Let's all stand to our feet. Come on, let's all stand to our feet. Let's hold our Bibles in our right hands above our head. If you have a Bible with you, hold it in your right hand. How many people know the courts still use the Bible? Come on. Alright, uh, even a secular institution still uses the Bible. And if they can use it, how many people know the church should be way ahead of them in using the Bible? Yes. Every courtroom in this country has Bibles in it. Yes. Alright, and, and they're not always believers. Sometimes the judge is an atheist or an agnostic or whatever. And so, come, let's hold up our Bibles. On the count of three, one, two, three. This is my Bible. I am. What it says I am. What it says I have, I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Please stay standing. First Corinthians 1, uh, 18 to 29. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who have been saved is the power of God, for it is written. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. How many of us believe? Amen. How many of us believe in Jesus Christ as our Amen. Savior? Alright, so we're saved. Verse 23. Sorry, verse 22. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, this is a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ is uh, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 
For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things. Everyone say the foolish things. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you. That we are the foolish things that you have chosen to confound the wise. Yes. Father, we thank you for your gospel, Lord. For the simplicity of your gospel. Father, we pray. Let us never stray from preaching Christ crucified. Lord, we know this is a, a stumbling block to the Jews. We know this is foolishness to the Greeks, Lord. But to us, it is the power of God. It is the saving power of Jesus. That Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins on the third day rose again. Lord, that is our confidence, Lord. Let us never stray from that message. Let that message be on our lips every single day. Let us share that message every single day. Let us tell people about Jesus. Jesus Christ crucified Amen. in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. You can be seated. I want to speak to you today about the dilemma. I want to speak to you today about the dilemma of evangelism. You know, evangelism is the art of proclaiming the good news, of going around and preaching and sharing the message that I've just mentioned. But in just about every Christian church in the world, they believe the world needs to be rich. It doesn't matter what denomination. If you went to any church and you asked them, does the world need to be rich with the gospel? They would give you a resounding yes. Oftentimes, churches will quote the Great Commission and quote other uh, evangelism scriptures in their name or in their, or in their statement of belief. Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This scripture, which were the last words of Jesus Christ, as recorded by Matthew, is known as the Great Commission. Everyone say the Great Commission. And the Great Commission was the last words that Jesus gave to his disciples. These were his... How many people know when someone's dying, their final words are important? When someone's dying, when someone's about to leave this earth, oftentimes their final words carry so much weight. They're very heavy, very, it tells you a lot about the person, it tells you a lot about what they believe. It's important that as they're about to die, these are their last words, and these were the last words of Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. We take the last words of Jesus Christ very seriously. Amen. That is our mission statement as a church. That is our heartbeat as a church. Mark says it this way in Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And when they say preacher, they're talking about human beings. Though I have known preachers to preach to animals in the hope the animals would get saved. Amen. And so the dilemma, the problem in many churches is not that we do not know what we should be doing, but that we don't do it. The problem isn't one of knowledge. The problem is one of obedience. We all believe that people should be saved. We believe our neighbours should be saved. We believe our spouses should be saved. We believe the mother of our children should be saved. The father of our children should be saved. Uh, we believe our bosses, our colleagues should be saved. We believe that Croydon needs Jesus. We, share, we shout out, Croydon belongs to Jesus. Uh, we have no problem in knowing what needs to be done. Our problem is doing something about it. You know... Everyone knows what the answer is to live a more healthy lifestyle. You know, there's a, um, uh, I saw a TV program, I saw an advert for it, and I think it says, uh, it's your fault, I'm fat. <laughs> How many people have seen that uh, program before? Come on, raise your hands, it's not just me, okay. And, and they're trying to blend, let me give you the answer, okay? Let me give you the answer. If you want to be healthier, eat less, exercise more. Thank you, Pastor. Simply eat less, exercise more. Now our problem is not knowing what should be what we should do. What's our problem? Is doing it. 
And that's the same thing when it comes to evangelism. Our problem is not knowing what needs to be done. Our problem is that we just don't do it. We just don't know about doing it. We understand the Great Commission. We understand that without Jesus, people are going to hell. Come on, someone. Someone better say amen today. How many people, I don't care who you are, I don't, color, I don't care the color of your skin, how smart you think you are, 99% of people who are good are going to hell. Yesterday I was talking to someone, I said to them, if you die today, where would you go? They said, I'm going to heaven. I said, why? They said, because I'm a good person. I said, uh, uh, wrong answer. If you think you're good, you're a candidate for hell. You need to hear that in the strongest language possible. Why? Because good people think they're going to heaven because of their goodness. Therefore, they don't need Jesus Christ. In other words, sinners who know that they are sinners, we need Jesus. I need Jesus. Let me tell you now, your goodness will never unlock the gates of heaven. You know what unlocks the gates of heaven? It's Jesus Christ. You see, what saves you is that you know you're sick. It's a bit like Jesus says, I'm the great physician, I'm the doctor. How many people know if you don't know you're sick, you'll never ask the doctor to help you? Come on, somebody. If you don't think you're sick, you know, this is the problem with the coronavirus, with COVID, right? A lot of people can have it, but don't have no symptoms of it, so they think they're okay. And all the while, there's a potential disease that could do them great harm. So it is when people think they're good. You will never hear me say, I'm a good person. What you will hear me say is that I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Come on somebody. Don't get it twisted. I don't care how you think you are. And by the way, let me just talk to you about good. Good compared to who? Yes. Who are you good compared to? Whenever I ask that question, you know what people say? I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. How many people know we can all look good according to murderers? If you compare me to a murderer, I'm Mother Teresa. But since when were murderers the standard for goodness? How many people know the standard for goodness is God's word and Jesus Christ? See, the issue is not how good are you compared to a murderer, a rapist, or a pedophile. The issue is how good are you according to God's word and to Jesus Christ? See, now it's different, isn't it? You know, now it's different, isn't it? You know, now that you compare yourself to Jesus, okay, maybe I am a sinner. Now you compare yourself to the word of God, okay, I accept I'm a sinner. But as long as I'm comparing myself to a rapist or a murderer, oh, I'm a good person. I've never raped anyone. Well, rapists are not the standard for goodness. Jesus Christ is the standard and the word of God is the standard. And I need someone other than my wife to say amen. 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 All right, a few of you believe that today. See, this is the problem. This is why people are going to hell. This is why people are, because people are walking around looking at the murderers, like the guy who killed us, uh, the sergeant the other day, and we look at that and say, yeah, you're a sinner. Yeah, you're a sinner. We have no problem saying that they're a sinner. The problem is the man in the mirror. And the dilemma is, the, the, the dilemma is that we know what should be done. We just don't do it. Many churches understand the Great Commission, but when it comes to practice or application of what they believe, many churches either don't know how to or don't have the spirit to evangelize. We know it should be done, but we just either don't know how to or just don't have the energy or the spirit or the desire to do it. The issue is not one of knowledge, but one of the beliefs. Luke chapter 6 verse 46, this is what Jesus says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? <laughs> How many people know that's a deep scripture? You know what Jesus is saying? How many people know if someone is your Lord, what does that make you? It makes you their servant. Everyone say servant. If Jesus is our Lord, we are his servants. How many people know servants do what their Lords tell them to do? And you know what Jesus is saying? He says, why are you calling me Lord? You never do anything I tell you to do. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things I tell you? You know, if I could give you a comparison in my circumstance, it's the amount of people that call me pastor but never come to my church. It's the amount of people that call me pastor but never do anything I say. 
You know, it's, it's interesting to me. Uh, the other day, someone came to me and says, Oh, pastor, you know, you're my pastor. Uh, you know, I'm a member of your church. They haven't been to church in three years. See, people think I was baptized with the name pastor. Pastor is my job title. <laughs> I don't even know that. I don't even know my real name is Clement. <laughs> pastor is what I do. And sometimes people don't seem to, sometimes they call me pastor, they call me by my first name. And I, know, I mean, I, everything in me wanted to say to this person, bro, I love you, I care for you. You haven't been to church in three years. Yeah, but you're still my pastor. If I've got any problems, I'm calling you first. If I need a reference, I'm going to call you. If I need to get my kids into a Christian school, I'm going to call you. <laughs> right? If I need anything, you're on my uh, speed dial. Well, the problem is when you ask for a reference, guess what they ask me? How many times does this person come to church? Weekly, fortnightly, or monthly? There isn't a box for annually. <laughs> There's no box for that. But you're my pastor. And I sense a little bit of Jesus' frustration when he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do the things I ask you to do, or I tell you to do? James 4 verse 17, James says, remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then don't do it. The other day, someone was asking me about Princess Diana, I wonder if it was our youth, was it, was it the youth on Wednesday, asking me about Princess Diana? Oh, it was you guys, wasn't it? We was having a debate on Wednesday night, I mean, was there about 10 young people after service having a debate about, uh, I don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about lots of stuff about the world, about life. And Princess Diana's name came up. Well, I remember where I was when Princess Diana, the first time I heard, it was a Sunday morning. My father-in-law, and this is how long ago it was, he called the house and the phone was in the front room. Some of you young people have no idea what that means right there. Amen. All right. And so I remember waking up early Sunday morning. Uh, and I tell you what, we was, we was cutting edge of technology because our phone had a fax machine with it as well. Uh. So, what's the fax machine? Anyway, I remember, you know, half asleep, early Sunday morning, we hadn't even got to church yet. I remember going to the phone, people said, hello? And I remember hearing a voice saying, she's dead. I said, what? She's dead. Who's dead? Princess Diana. I said, what? No way. And I remember that very clearly, I'll never forget that. Well, when Princess Diana had a car crash coming from the Paris Ritz and she was with the chauffeur, Trevor Ritz was the SAS ex-bodyguard, she was with uh, uh, Mohammed al Fayed's son, Dolby Fayed, in the back seat of the car. And we don't really know what happened, but there was some sort of car crash. She's not wearing a seatbelt, but she was still alive. She was still alive. She was still moaning and groaning in the back seat of the car. Well, they're being chased by the paparazzi, which is the photographers that make money from taking pictures. They sell them to news agencies around the world. Well, guess what happened? These photographers, uh, they put their cameras into the car and were taking pictures of Princess Diana while she was dying, while she was still alive. And the story is they sent them to some agencies, some editors, and the editors told them, you better burn those pictures. Because in France, there is a law that says, if you see someone that needs help and you don't do anything about it, you can be prosecuted. If you see someone in trouble, if, and I don't know the French phrase, uh, uh, who, who speaks French here? Someone tell me. Who knows what the phrase is? Is it true? What, what's it called? What's that law called? Do you know? Right, you don't assist someone in danger. You can be prosecuted. You can be arrested because you did not assist someone who is in danger. Yes. Listen to what the Bible says. If you, let me read to you the scripture. Ah, oh, where was it? The Bible says, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then you don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sin. Do you know you need to tell people about Jesus? Yeah. Do you do it? Your silence can be a sin. You know, the night I got saved, my reaction when I came out of church was, I wonder how many people know what I know. I mean, I was stunned that this world was walking past me and didn't know about Jesus. 
We'd go on trains, tell people about Jesus. You know what we did on a Friday night? You know what was our Friday night when I was a, a young Christian, new in the faith? We'd carry our PA system, carry boxes, uh, big speaker boxes, carry generators, carry petrol cans with, uh, with diesel for the generator. We'd all jump on the train, we'd go up to Leicester Square on a Friday night. We'd set up our PA system right there in Leicester Square, right by the Odeon, uh, right by thousands, hundreds of thousands of people walking past. We'd get the PA system, you know, fire it up, get on the mic, and we start preaching. We start telling people about Jesus. We start witnessing to people. We go outside all the X-rated shops and we'd be preaching at the shops. You know, no one would go in there while the church was out preaching. That's what we did. Why? Because we knew this was the heartbeat of Jesus Christ, and we also knew that if we know what we should do and we don't do it, to us it is sin. Somebody say amen to that. See, it's a sin. Not to go on outreach when you know you should. It's a sin not to tell people about Jesus when you know you should. It's a sin to sit in a crowd of people who are all destined for hell and you keep quiet. It's a sin. James 1, 22. James 1, 22 says, But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise you're only fooling yourself. The Bible says, Don't just be hearers of the word. But be doers of the word. Don't just hear it. Pastor, great sermon. Pastor, I agree with what you said. See you next Sunday. No, we don't preach for information. We preach for transformation. Come on, somebody. We're not just giving you. This isn't just a clever speech. You, you haven't just come to hear someone get excited about the Bible and talk to you about the Bible. No, we want some transformation. From, we want changes in your life as a result of what you've heard. Yeah. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be yes. doers of the word. Don't deceive yourself. Don't fool yourself. I mean, what's the point of listening to the word of God if you're never going to do what the word of God says? This is why Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I tell you to do? He says, what's the point? Well, I mean, why are you calling me your Lord? You know, and I don't think Jesus is saying like he's angry. I think there's a sense of frustration. He says, why do you call me Lord, but you never do what I tell you to do? Every time I tell you to do something, you've got a better idea. You do your own thing. You make a God in your own image. You know, the Bible calls that idolatry. How many people know people make a God in their own image? Oh, well, my God wouldn't do that. Well, my God doesn't mind this. Well, my God's okay with how I'm living. Well, my God's okay with this. Well, my God loves me. He won't judge me. It's called idolatry. You're making a God in your own image. That's a God in your mind. That's not the God of the Bible. And I'm constantly having to remind people that the same God who created heaven also created hell. You know what most of the world does? They focus on the heaven God. Yeah. <laughs> they focus on the God who created heaven, but they don't realize that love is heaven and hell, not just heaven. Yeah. And it's a sin to know what we should do. And die. here's one of the foundational doctrines of Christianity. So much so that evangelism is a part of our title, if you like, and that we are evangelical. Alright, the word evangelical is linked to the word evangelism, which literally means they preach as they go. Can I say something to you? I'm always talking to people about Jesus. Every day, probably, I'm telling someone about Jesus. Uh, there's an atheist guy who I work with and I do some transactions with. Every time he wants to swear, he says, Jesus Christ. And I keep on chatting with him. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, I said to him, why don't you say Muhammad? He goes, you're right. How many people know if he said Muhammad, the Muslims would get mad at him? Say amen to him. They'll put a fatwa when he's behind. Amen. They do a jihad. They'll, they'll, hey, hey. They'll come looking for him. If every time you wanted to swear, you said Muhammad, Muslims would get upset. But every time you want to swear, you say Jesus, and Christians don't say a word. I actually mocked him. I said, for an atheist, you do mention Jesus quite a lot. You ever notice that atheist that mentioned God all the time? One man said, the church that does not evangelize 
will eventually fossilize. Let me tell you one more time. The church that does not evangelize will eventually fossilize. They'll die out. And one of the scary things about COVID-19 is that some churches haven't opened for six months. Yeah. I'm hearing that some churches will not open until next year. I'm like, hey buddy, your church may well end up fossilizing. Because how many people know you can still go to hell during lockdown? Yeah. <laughs> how many people know heaven and hell aren't on lockdown? They're not on social distancing. Heaven and hell are still open for business. Clovis Chapel, in his book, Sermon, Sermons from the Parables, he says, The eye that refuses to see will soon go out. The ear that refuses to hear will become stopped. The right hand that refuses to serve will lose its cunning. The family that refuses to produce children will die. The church that fails to evangelize will cease to exist. You see, if you don't believe that the heart of the gospel is saving sinners from hell, you won't witness. You won't witness to people. I'll say it one more time. If you don't believe that the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to save sinners from hell, then you won't witness. Yesterday when I was talking to that Israeli guy, his name's Neil, nice guy, we had a great conversation, had a great chat, and um, uh, he made the comment about why I was doing this, and I said, I'm doing this out of love. I said, you know what, if I come out on Saturday or not, no one knows, no one's checking up on me, no one's telling me you've got to do this, you know, I don't get paid for doing it, this is, you know, it's like, you do it or you don't do it. And he says, well, why are you doing it? So I do it because I love you. And I do it because I know that without this message, you're not going to make heaven your home. And you know what I've also realized is that evangelism doesn't always just start on the streets. Evangelism starts in the church. There's a lot of people that come to church who aren't saved. Say amen, somebody. There's a lot of people who come to the house of God who are not born again. And we've got to evangelize. Mark 9, 47, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, as spoken by Jesus. Now, how many people Jesus is not saying, literally, pluck your eyes out? How many people know if he did mean that literally, we'd all be blind? So say it to somebody. Oh, we'd all be blind. What's he saying? Whatever is in your life that is stopping you from going to heaven, Get rid of it because it's better for you to go to heaven without that thing that is in your life than to go to hell with that thing in your life. <laughs> Whatever's causing you to sin, whatever's causing you to get in the way of your relationship with God, whatever is causing you to miss heaven, get rid of it because it's better for you to go to heaven without that thing than to go to hell with that thing and that's the words of Jesus Christ so let me ask you a quick question what are the things that can be in our lives that can make us miss heaven someone shout them out someone just shout out some things that could be in the person's life that would make them miss heaven fornication fornication what else? You know, does everyone understand what fornication is? Sex outside the marriage will make it this heaven. Alright? Anything else? That's not the only one. Come on, someone. What are the things that can be in a person's life that can make them miss heaven? Greed. Greed. Very good. Anyone else? Sorry? Alright, murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. The Bible's lots to say about murder. What are the things in our lives that we might need to get rid of because it's better for us to go to heaven without that thing than to go to hell with that thing? Come on somebody, shout it out. Hatred. Hatred. That's a good one. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. Come on now. And pride. Come on now. It's, if, if there's pride in your life, if pride causes you to sin and pride is the original sin, get rid of it 
Because it's better for you to go to heaven without pride than to go to hell with pride. The other day I was talking to a lady sitting on our wall and she had a busted hand. I said, can I pray for you? She goes, yeah, I'd love for you to pray. You're the pastor. I said, yeah, I'm the pastor. Pray for me. Pray. I led in a simple prayer. Dear Lord, she repeated, she goes, dear Lord, forgive me my sins. She stopped. She goes, I'm not a sinner. I said, sorry? She stopped the prayer. She goes, oh, no, no, I don't want to pray anymore. I said, what do you mean? She goes, oh, I'm not a sinner. You said, forgive me my sins. I'm not a sinner. <laughs> and I began to try and talk to her about how we're all sinners. We're actually born into sin. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. We are born sinners. You don't need to teach a child to be naughty. Children are naughty by themselves. Every parent spends their whole entire life trying to teach their children to be good. Why? Because by nature, children are not good. And adults are simply children in bigger bodies. She goes, no, I'm not a sinner. And I tried to talk to her about it, and she wouldn't listen. Let me tell you that now. That prize will be taken to hell. Yeah. And Jesus says, if there's something in your life that causes you to sin, pluck it out, get rid of it, because it's better for you to go to heaven without that thing that's causing you to sin than for you to go to hell without that thing in your life. What other things cause people to miss God? Come on, give me one or two other things real quickly. Shout it out. Adultery. Adultery. Come on now. Oh, idolatry, sorry, okay. Well, I'll take adultery and idolatry, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Idolatry is worshipping man-made images. You ever notice about our church building? No statues. No crosses. No images. No man-made images. If we just walked you into this building and asked you, what is this building? You'd say, I'm not sure. What is it? See, some of us, we don't understand idolatry. You know, I'm not against people wearing crosses around their neck, but I'll never wear a cross around my neck. And I'll never wear a cross around my neck with an idol of Jesus on it. Why? Jesus isn't on the cross anymore. If you're going to wear a cross, let the cross be empty. The cross is empty. Can somebody say amen? amen. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He is alive. It is finished, he has said. Amen. He's not what I was raised as a Catholic. Raised with statues of Jesus bigger than me. Normally, you know, the, the Jesus that I grew up with was a European Jesus. He was blonde. He was blue-eyed. You know, he didn't look like me. Didn't have an afro. Didn't have big lips like me. He looked like he just come from Hollywood. Right? Well, that's a man-made image. That's an image in man's imagination. And oftentimes, idolatry, when we imagine God, aside from the Bible, every image we have of God should line up with the Bible. If not, Amen. it's a God in our own image. Amen. You want to know what God looks like? Read the Bible. You want to know how God thinks? Read the Bible. Well, I don't think God believes that. Show me the Bible where it says that. If not, you're making up a God in your own image. Anything else? Let me take one more, two, one or two more, then we're going to move on. What things can there be in a person's life that will cause them to miss heaven. Jealousy. Materialism. What do you say, young man? Jealousy. Jealousy. Ooh, out of the mouth of... How old are you, Winston Jr.? Nine. Nine years old. How many people know the Bible says we shouldn't covet our neighbor's goods? That's one of the Ten Commandments, oh. isn't it? It's okay to be inspired. You know what? Let me tell you what happened the other day. The other day, my cousin came round to our house. Uh, it's actually uh, Tracy Ann's cousin, but hey, he's my cousin as well. Uh, he hired out a sports car. He hired out a £150,000 McLaren 520S convertible. We could hear him coming up the street, because we knew he was coming. But I opened the window, I said, I, I, I'll know when he's outside so I can hear the engine. He says, hey, big cars, let's go for a drive. I said, yeah, come on now. Had my trainers ready, jumped in the car, the two of us driving around Croydon in this rocket ship on wheels. And him being a good little cousin, let big cousin drive the car. Now I've got to be honest, I was scared at first. You know, this is a very powerful car. So I'm driving around Croydon, you know, and I'm driving carefully, I'm doing 20 miles an hour in a car that can do 204 miles an hour. And I'm driving around, but you know what happens to men after they drive the car around for a while? 
We get a big covenant, it's like hitting that set of, rum, 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 rum. it's like tearing up the street. I mean, seriously, we was going, there was, I found a nice road, a long road that was nice and quiet. And I raced up and down the street when the neighbors came out. What the heck are you guys doing? Ah, oh, sorry, bye. And we got out of there. I'm driving around this sports car, and you know what I did? I took a picture of myself with the car, and I put it on my WhatsApp status. Look at my new car. <laughs> oh, the response I got. Oh, oh, there was a lot of love, there was a little bit of jealousy. What, 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 what? That's your car, seriously, are you real? Are you being serious? I'm like, yeah, it's my new car. 150,000 pounds, 204 miles an hour. There was a little bit of jealousy in there. Somebody say amen to that. And you know what, I wanted by just let it stay like that for a while. Left it for about a day or two. And I said, nah, I'm only kidding, it's not my car, it's my cousin's car, but thanks for your responses. Some people are jealous. Come on, someone, say, say amen. They've got green eyes, envy. They see you with something nice and they're like, where did you get that car from? Where did you get those trainers from? Where did you get that husband or wife from? Come on, somebody. You know, you, you ever see a couple, they look so good together, but because you're single, you look at them and think, me and him would look better together, or me and her would look better together. It's not every, anyway, let me move on from that. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, let me say to Jesse Church, if you don't evangelize, over time you'll become religious. Yes, you know what keeps you fresh? You know what keeps you on fire for God? Is that you're constantly going out and talking to people about Jesus. And can I say to you, it's easier to win a stranger to Jesus than it is to win your friends and family to Jesus. You ever notice that? Friends and family are hard to reach, aren't they? Friends and family are hard to, because, because they know you and they're, and they're biased against you for good or for bad. And friends and family are often very difficult, but a stranger, you can tell them about Jesus and in less than 10 minutes, you can be leading them to Christ. Imagine getting strangers to pray in Croydon High Street, outside McDonald's, acknowledging that they're sinners and they want to receive Jesus Christ. Amen. I think that's powerful. That's amazing. Let me wrap this up real quickly and talk to you about the dilemma of rejection. Because if we're going to talk about evangelism, we've got to talk about the truth of rejection. Everyone say rejection. Yeah. This is one of the primary reasons why people don't evangelize. Because they're afraid of rejection. How many people here, you just love being rejected? Come on, raise your hand if you love being rejected. None of us like it, do we? You know, people are afraid that if you go out and tell someone about Jesus, that they're going to say to you, I'm not interested, or don't worry about it. Let me tell you this now. I've probably been rejected more than all of you guys put together. I'll never forget one time I was outreaching in South Bend on sea. And we was door knocking. Saturday morning, 11 o'clock, we're knocking on doors, just telling people about Jesus, inviting them to come to a, a church in South End. I'll never forget one guy, I went up the gate, opened up the gate, looked up the path, knocked on the door, and I said, excuse me sir, sorry to trouble you, but we're just from the local church, we just wanted to tell you about Jesus and invite you along to a concert we had that night. A little short guy, knocked up at me and says, come here son, come here, come here. He walks out of the house, he kind of like puts his arm on my shoulder, he walks me off his property, he walks me out the gate, he says, you see this house? It's all paid for. You see the caravan in the front garden? That's mine, it's all paid for. You see the car parked out? That's my car, it's all paid for. Why do I need Jesus? And he gently pushed me out and shut the gate and went back in. And I'm standing there outside, I can't believe he's just said that to me. He doesn't need Jesus because of his house, his caravan, his car. And the truth is, many of you cannot handle rejection. You can't handle it. You know, it's part of being on social media, isn't it? You know, on social media, what do we want? We want everyone to give us likes. We want likes, not likes. Like my picture, like my post, like, 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 like. And we can't handle it. You know, how many people have ever had something on social media, you had a load of likes, but one dislike, and you focus on that one dislike? You want to know, well, who is it? Who is it who disliked what I pop up? You ignore the multitudes that liked what you did and you focus on the one dislike. Because we can't handle rejection. 
But can I say to you that as Christians, rejection is a part of who we are, of what we do. You know there's some people who are afraid of hospitals? Do you know that? There's some people who are afraid of hospitals. You know there's some people who are afraid of needles? Oh, yeah. Right? There's lots of people afraid of needles. But how many people know when their nurse or a doctor is using a needle on you, they're not doing it to hurt you, they're doing it to help you. And so to be rejected as a believer is just normal. And one of the reasons why so many believers won't go on outreach is because you're afraid of rejection. Not everyone's going to be glad when you tell them about Jesus. You know, I've heard stories of people being fired on their jobs because they, they told someone about Jesus. Uh, many years ago, there was a lady who worked for British Airways and she had a little cross. I mean, this was the tiniest cross you've ever seen. It was no bigger than a 10 pence piece around her neck and it was just two pieces of metal in the cross around her neck. She was fired because she wouldn't take it off. I'm like, you know what, if there was one reason why I would wear a cross, that's just to wind up people who don't want us to wear crosses. And if I was to wear one, it would be the biggest one ever, amen. A two foot cross around my front, yeah, look at that, look at that right now, amen. But they fired her because she had the tiny ten penny piece cross around her neck. You see, there are people who have been warned. They've been disciplined on their jobs because they talk about Jesus on their jobs. You know, I used to work in Canary Wharf, had a great job uh, working for a merchant bank. I had my wife's Bible. My wife has this big burgundy King James translation Bible. I used to take my Bible and put it right there. So by my desk, there were some filing cabinets about that high, and my desk was by the front door. So everyone who came into the office had to be past my desk. I, put her, I just opened up a Bible and put it right there. Everyone who came into Sedell Bank or Clearstream Bank in the morning, you had to walk past my desk, you see the Bible opened. My screensaver, I had a screensaver back then, and it was a uh, picture of Jesus, the European Jesus I'm afraid to say, who was crying over the world. It was like he's in outer space, he's looking at the world, and he's crying over the world. That was my screensaver. And because I worked for the IT department, we had the biggest monitors in the whole company. So you walked into the office, you went past reception, you came past my desk, you saw my wife's King James Bible open, and you saw my screensaver with Jesus crying over the world. See, people get into trouble on their jobs when they talk about Jesus. And I remember, we would talk about football, we never had an argument about football. We would talk about politics, no problem, but as soon as you talk about Jesus, you get a reaction. And you need to know the devil doesn't want you to talk about Jesus. What did you do last night? Oh, went back to the pub, went back to a nightclub, had a couple of curries, a couple of kebabs, got sick, got home at 8 o'clock in the morning, had a great weekend. Clement, what did you do on the weekend? Oh, we went outreach, had prayer meeting, had a concert in the evening, went to church twice on Sunday, people got saved, it was awesome. And the reaction is weird. And there's a negative reaction to that. You need to know the devil wants you to keep quiet about Jesus. He wants to rob you of your boldness. Let me wrap this up real quickly. Acts 4, 18. And they called the disciples and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't care what you speak about as long as you don't mention Jesus. The devil doesn't care about what you talk about. I remember one time I was in Australia, we used to do some street evangelism. I don't forget, a guy sitting down, it was a really hot day. Uh, the guy sitting down, and I said, hey, um, I went to give him a leaflet. He says, is this about church? I said, yeah, he goes, I'm not interested. Do you know what I did? I put the flower away and I began talking to him just about life. He spent 20 minutes talking to me about life. And it was interesting, he had no problem talking to me about stuff as long as it wasn't Jesus. In our generation, you can talk about whatever you want, just don't talk about Jesus, just don't talk about sin, just don't talk about salvation. Even the word hell, people don't like it. Yeah. They'll talk about heaven, yeah. just don't talk about hell. Oh, hell, we don't like it. Yeah. Hell. Everyone say hell. hell. Oh, say it like you mean, say hell. hell. Everyone say heaven. heaven. You said heaven, but you said hell. See, heaven is easy. It's nice. 
We don't like to talk about hell. There's a strategy from the devil. He uses intimidation. He uses fear. He uses pride. He uses embarrassment to rob us talking about Jesus. And nothing pokes the devil in the eye like outreach. You know, you know pardon me, for five years, that's why I like going on outreach, just to wind the devil up. I want the devil to get mad. Uh oh, he's going on outreach again. He's going on outreach. He's praying with people publicly. People are getting saved. How do people know the devil hates that? Yes. But you know what the devil would hate even more? Is if you did it as well. Yeah. Can you imagine if everyone here today went on outreach? Can you imagine if everyone here won one person to Jesus? The difference it would make to our lives. See, rejection is a part of the Christian life. Jesus faced rejection. John 15 verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. 1 John 3 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. If you are a genuine Christian, the world should hate you. If you are genuinely following the uh, footsteps of Jesus Christ, if the world hates Jesus, they're going to hate his followers. How many people know how Jesus was killed? Jesus was crucified. Do you know what happened to 11 out of his 12 disciples? They were all killed for their faith. Apart from John, who wrote the book of Revelation, and the book of uh, 1 John, 2 John, and the Gospel of John, he was exiled to an island called Patmos, and he lived there for the rest of his life in exile. Think about it for a second. Jesus is killed because of what he's teaching. His disciples copy him, follow him, and they're all killed. But yet, us, nothing's happening to us at all. Could it be that we're not fully following Jesus? Because how many people know if you copy Jesus, some of what happened to Jesus is going to happen to you? And Jesus says, hey, don't worry about the world hating you. They hated me before they hated you. And can I say to you, they're not rejecting you. Guess what they're rejecting? Wow. That hasn't happened for a while. Amen. And guess what they're rejecting? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the Jesus that's in you. Can somebody say amen? amen? That guy in Australia, when I gave him a leaf, when I wanted to talk to him about Jesus, he wasn't rejecting me. He was rejecting what I was representing. And as soon as I stopped talking about Jesus, he was happy to talk to me for 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Beloved, don't get it twisted. It's not you they don't like, it's the Christ in you they have a problem with. And I'm going to tell you now, rejection is not final. Sometimes the best thing that can happen to us in life is that we get rejected. Yeah. 